Are we live? Yeah. Sharif, can we start? Yes, ma'am, you are live. Okay. So, welcome everyone uh, today uh, to this AIOS masterclass. And uh, in this masterclass, uh, we have a very illustrious speaker of uh, national and international acclaim. Uh, Dr. Santosh Hunavar is going to be speaking on Orbit, uh, Pandora's box uh, demystified. Uh, Dr. Santosh Hunavar uh, does not need any introduction to the uh, audience or to the people who are watching. He's the editor general of uh, uh, the Journal of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology at All India Ophthalmological Society. Director of Medical Services and Director Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery, Orbit and Ocular Oncology, Center for Science, Super Speciality, Group of Eye Hospitals um, at Hyderabad uh, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Telangana. Uh, Santosh uh, is, has done his residency training in ophthalmology, followed by his uh, senior residency in ophthalmic plastic surgery and onco on ocular oncology at RP Center in New Delhi. He trained in ocular oncology and was mentored by Professor Jerry Shields and Professor Carol Shields at the Wills Eye Hospital, Philadelphia, USA. He established ocular oncology services at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, and he was the associate director of LVPI and established the residency program. Uh, he currently heads the Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Ocular Oncology and the National Retinoblastoma Foundation at Center for Sight, Hyderabad, and leads the medical services team and the CFS education. He has published extensively and figures among the top 2% in the world and top 10 Indian ophthalmologists in his research output. To his credit, he has several awards uh, right from his residency days, which include the Colonel Rangachari Gold Medal by AIOS, Dr. Sivaredi International Award by AIOS, the very coveted uh, Shanti Swaroop Bhatnagar Award by the Government of India, Professor M.A. Mateen Award by the Bangladesh Academy of Ophthalmology, Jerry Shields International Award by the Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, APO Distinguished Services uh, uh, Award uh, in 2018, and the Peters Rogers Oration uh, ANZ SOPS uh, in 2019. He's the only Indian ophthalmologist to be bestowed upon the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology 2019 and the prestigious Fellowship of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, London, U UK. He is, of course, currently the editor of Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, the Indian Journal of uh, Ophthalmology Case Reports. And very recently this year, he's also launched the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology uh, videos. So that is something to look forward to. Uh, more importantly, he's a very close uh, friend right from the RP Center days. And I welcome Santosh uh, to this webinar. And I'm, I'm sure uh, that we all are looking uh, forward to hearing his talk. Uh, I also have uh, in the expert panel, uh, Dr. Vikas Menon, a consultant of thalmic plastic surgery and ocular oncology, Arvind Eye Hospital, Chennai, who did his post-graduation from uh, Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, a fellowship in the ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbital surgery, and ocular oncology from Edi Prasada Institute, Hyderabad. Uh, he's uh, currently the consultant. He was also the consultant in Department of Ophthalmic Plastic Surgery and Oncology at Center for Sight, New Delhi from 2008 to 2021. And presently, he's the consultant of thalmoplastic surgery and oncology services at Arvind Eye Hospital in Chennai. He has, to his credit, nearly 200 presentations in national and international conferences, 32 publications, including the peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals and chapters in textbooks. And he's reviewer and section editor for oculoplasty uh, in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and reviewer for the Journal of Ophthalmic, Plastic, and Reconstructive Surgery. We have in the expert panel, Dr. Seema Das, consultant and head of oculoplasty and oncology, at Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, Delhi. And uh, she's also in charge of the Department of Medical Education. Uh, she uh, has been a fellow at LV Prasad Eye Institute and uh, is, pass, uh, is a pass out from Guru Nanak Eye Center. She has done her long-term fellowship in orbit oculoplasty and oncology at LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, and observership in ocular oncology services at Wills Eye Hospital, uh, Philadelphia, USA. 
She is the recipient of various awards such as the Raman Mittal Award for Best Free Paper at Annual Conference of OPI, G. N. Rao Best Fellow Award, uh, All India Ophthalmology Quiz Winner, just to name a few. And she has more than 50 publications to her credit in various scientific journals, as well as presentations at national and international level conferences and seminars. Her areas of interest include knowledge enhancement in the field of tumors of the eye, childhood eye cancer, retinoblastoma, reconstructive and cosmetic surgery like ptosis, eyelid reconstruction, orbital fracture repair, and lacrimal system surgery. I will be joined uh, by uh, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, the Honorary Treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society, and Professor at Konya Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And now we welcome Dr. Santosh Ranavar again and over him for his uh, masterclass. Ramrita, for the opportunity, I thank All India Ophthalmological Society for this uh, opportunity to speak to you. Uh, on in part of the masterclass series. Is my screen visible, Namrata? Yeah, perfect. So I'll be talking about orbital tumors, Pandora's box, demystified, and specifically we'll be concentrating on uh, orbital tumors. The Pandora's box is from mythology where uh, it contained all the evil. Once this curious Pandora opened the box, everything that was evil escaped. And it was a big challenge to put, the, put these all back in the box. In case of Orbit, it's called Pandora's box. The main reason being it has some of the evil. 50% of orbital tumors are malignant, potentially life-threatening. That is the reason when you deal with orbital tumors, you have to have a logical approach, a stepwise approach, and very strong backing of oncological principles. As we know, primary goal of any malignant tumor is life salvage, followed by, if possible, eye salvage and optimal residual vision. So whenever you have a patient with a potential orbital tumor, you have to ask these questions and answer it yourself. What is it likely to be? Is it a benign tumor or a malignant tumor or a mass crowd, maybe an inflammation, infection? Where is it located in the orbit? Is it intraconal, extraconal, or involves both the compartments? What are its relationships? Is it related to any of the crucial structures such as the optic nerve and extraocular muscles? Is it operable at all? Can I operate it? Or is it not in my uh, realm in the sense that is it a neurosurgical condition? What approach would I take? Would I do it by the skin approach? Would I take the transcending towel approach? And what do I expect out of the whole procedure? Now, uh, to approach orbit in a stepwise manner, we have to start with a good clinical history followed by regional examination. Regional examination would include orbit and the phase and the regional lymph nodes, followed by appropriate systemic examination. For example, if you're suspecting neurofibroma, then obviously you look for stigma of NF1. Then you do appropriate imaging. Appropriate imaging in the sense that if you're thinking of, say, orbital cysticercosis, then all you may want is a ultrasound B scan to look at the cyst and the scolex. If you are thinking of optic nerve glioma, then obviously your primary uh, imaging would be MRI scan. Whereas if you are thinking of a cavernous hemangioma, maybe just a CT scan with contrast. So based on what you clinically suspect, you advise imaging modalities appropriately. That is followed by appropriate systemic investigations. I'll talk to you about that as we deal with each tumor. Then you plan surgery and the treatment is not, uh, does not end with surgery. Obviously, you have to have histopathology and then get that information to further manage the patient. For postgraduates, when they're asked about six P's of the orbit, these are pain. You have to characterize pain and the severity of pain. Is it a dull ache? Is it a severe pain? Is it constant? Is it intermittent? Does it change with movement of the eye? Etc. Progression would have two components onset being acute in days, subacute in terms of weeks, and chronic in months to years. Progression is further categorized as rapid, slow, and indolent. Proptosis itself is the third P. Palpation, pulsation, and periorbital changes. These are generally asked in the exam for postgraduate students what are six P's 
um, but well, you don't have to actually go through this six piece, but what is important is assessment of proptosis in a very systematic way. What we use for assessment of proptosis is an exophthalmometer. Now, the standard way of uh, doing exophthalmometry is by using Hertel's exophthalmometry. But of course, you have lutes, and if there is no orbital margin uh, as a measure of standardization, then you can use much exothermometer where the frontal bone is used as a standard of measurement. Then you also measure the displacement using transparent scales. Then you assess ocular motility in nine gazes. Where required, you perform a force duction test and also develop your chart. I wouldn't go through the details of these Palpation would, what I mean to say is that palpation would involve evaluation of all these aspects and each of these has to be quantified and documented in terms of the terminologies that are shown here. So that's a lecture by itself, evaluation of the orbit, but basically palpation has to be very detailed. Not to forget the evaluation of visual acuity, color vision, grading of relative afferent pupillary defect, Schirmer's test is important when you're dealing with lacrimal gland tumors. And of course, basic ocular examination, cranial love examination, fundus evaluation, and oral and nasal examination if required. Imaging uh, is based on what you suspect clinically. It could be a B scan, MRI, or a CT scan with contrast. Now, these are the five lesions which can cause proptosis. I would deal with neoplastic mainly. And tumors of the orbit, a broad classification is primary, each of which can be benign or malignant or secondary. Now, primary tumors can be further classified as this. Cystic lesions are not necessarily tumors, but they come to an ocular oncologist. That is the reason why they're there in the classification. Vascular tumors, peripheral nerve tumors, optic nerve and meningeal tumors, myogenic tumors, fibrous connective tissue tumors, osseous fibrosseous tumors, histiocytic, melanocytic, and epithelial tumors of the lacrimal gland. Now, sometimes you're confused as to which could be your differential diagnosis. So it's always good to know what is prevalent in the region. This is from a large study of about 1000 biopsies, where we found that lymphoproliferative vascular secondary and cystic tumors constitute roughly about 14% each. That is followed by neurogenic inflammation, mesenchymal and lacrimal gland tumors ranging from about seven to nine percent. Everything else comes still lower. So if you know what are the most common lesions in the region, in the sense that India and Asia, then you would be better off in narrowing down your differential diagnosis. Let's start with congenital lesions. This is a newborn child coming to you with what looks like proptosis. It's not proptosis, it's a bulge in the orbital region and it has a bluish discoloration. And if you look at the other eye carefully, cornea is not spherical. Cornea has what is called triangulation. It has this kind of a configuration and the child has a iris coloboma. Now in this situation, the one thing that you think of is colobomatous cyst. Colobomatous cyst of the orbit, where the most important aspect is to prognosticate patient. You can of course image and measure the size of the lesion, but the simplest way to prognosticate is look at the eye itself. And how do you look at the eye? By aspirating the contents of the cyst, you look at the eye, and if there is no visual potential, then you can do sclerotherapy. This was published earlier where the cyst was aspirated, prognosticated for vision, and the cyst was injected with ethylonamine oleate. And once sclerosis settles in, you can place a good cosmetically fitting orbital prosthesis. Now, the second condition by birth where there is bulge of the eye or, simul or what simulates proptosis is congenital cystic eye. Here you find that the eye is cystic. It has absent normal architecture, except the optic now, of course, is present. But the lateral wall of the eye is actually merging with the periorbita. Lens is missing, as you see there. This is congenital cystic eye. Here, all you can achieve is cosmosis by doing either enucleation or evisceration. Now, the third condition where a child presents with proptosis is orbital teratoma. Now, orbital teratoma can be benign or malignant. Since you cannot predict 
whether a teratoma is benign or malignant, just based on clinical evaluation, radiology is important. Involvement of the bone, intracranial extension, and also periocular hemorrhage indicates malignant teratoma. And also the pace with which it grows, the rapidity of the growth of the lesion and consequently proptosis also indicates that it is malignant, whereas benign grows very slowly. This looks like a benign teratoma because this has been growing very slowly, but the child has upward displacement of the eye and medial displacement of the eye. This was a large lesion which was on both the sides of the optic nerve. And there's a fully grown tooth in it on imaging that confirms that it is indeed a teratoma of the orbit. Another condition in children which can cause proptosis is an eyelid condition or periocular condition, which is capillary hemangioma of infancy, but it can have orbital extension because of which there may be proptosis and displacement. This can be easily treated with systemic or oral propranolol or intralesional transolol. If the child has a high risk of amblyopia, as you see here, where it is important that we reduce the size of the lesion as rapidly as possible so that amblyopia treatment can be facilitated, then intralesional steroids is a good option. As you see in here, the lesion has regressed and the orbital component that was causing proptosis has also resolved. Another condition in children is intraosseous hemangioma, which can cause a triradiate lesion. Triradiate lesion is because it centers on the spinoid wing and has orbital, temporal fossa and intracranial extension. The classic treatment for this condition is curatage. If you were to classify proptosis in children because of tumors, axial proptosis is caused by optic nerve glioma. Now, among abaxial proptosis, if you consider subacute lesions which evolve during weeks to months, then it is rhabdomyosarcoma which in fact is the most common primary orbital malignancy in children, followed by one more round cell tumor, which is leukemia, primitive neuroectodermal tumor, and alveolar soft part sarcoma. In chronic abaxial proptosis in children, we have lymphangioma and dermoid. Let's look at some of the examples. This child comes with left eye axial proptosis and poor visual attention in the left eye and she has an optic nerve glioma in the posterior aspect and also intracranial, intracanalicular and intracranial extension. Now, this is a child with bilateral optic nerve glioma. So, if you have a patient where suspected optic nerve glioma is present, then it is imminent that you look for other stigma, starting with the eye lesions such as Lish nodules to even systemic evaluation is mandatory, looking for cafeolase spots and all the other stigma of neurofibroma because that can often clinch the diagnosis. If a child has unilateral or bilateral optic nerve glioma, then the current standard of care is chemotherapy, actually. You may be surprised to know, but that is the current standard of care because it can reduce the size of the lesion by about 20 to 30% and can also stabilize the lesion. In young children, radiotherapy may be contraindicated because of the location of the lesion itself and the possible damage to the pituitary gland. Once radiotherapy is feasible, it can be provided in a stereotactic uh, um, radiation planning system, and that can actually further help reduce the size of the lesion and also stabilize it. If the child has no vision at all and the lesion is restricted only to the orbit, then possibly excision is also an option. Rhabdomyosarcoma is a cause for abaxial proptosis in a subacute kind of a setting. It presents with a fleshy lesion which sometimes can be seen through the superior phonics, that is the botryoid variant, whereas the lesion itself is in the mid-orbit and it is isodense on CT scan and isointense on MRI. This is one more patient with rhabdomyosarcoma in the inferior orbit. It can actually simulate a infection or inflammation because of its rapid onset and the vascularity and the kind of swelling around the lesion that it produces because it's a rapidly growing lesion, it has some amount of necrosis that is inherent to it, which can cause inflammation. Another condition in children is granulocytic sarcoma in AML. And the tip off is subconjunctival hemorrhage. This child actually has subconjunctival hemorrhage. And when we looked, looked at the fundus, she had pale centered hemorrhages or hot spots as well, thus clinically clinching the diagnosis. And of course, peripheral blood smear is confirmatory.
primitive neuroectodermal tumor and rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma cannot be clinically differentiated only on biopsy would you be able to differentiate if a child were to have a baxal or axial proptosis with a very well circumscribed lesion but with ocular motility restriction lesion being associated with one of the extraocular muscles then the clinical suspicion should be towards alveolar soft part sarcoma it is a surgical disease where it has to be completely excised and what we give additionally is adjuvant radiation now orbital lymphangioma can be a chronic proptosis but in the setting of chronic proptosis like this child lady has mild chronic proptosis there could be acute exacerbation because of intralesional hemorrhage ca causing what is called chocolate cyst that can simulate a kind of inflammation or infection with sudden onset proptosis the mild chronic proptosis as this lady has may not even be noticeable but when this happens when there is intralesional bleed as in this child proptosis becomes very much noticeable and the child becomes symptomatic dermoid of course everyone is aware of it can be in various locations medial lateral medial angular internal angular as it's called or external angular this is internal angular this is external angular one more case of internal angular dermoid and it could be on the temporal aspect as well these are various configurations of orbital dermoids you can see this one is in the superior orbit right at the superior rectus lps complex area and extending quite posteriorly whereas this is an anteriorly located dermoid and this is an intraosseous dermoid you can see destruction of the bone in that region dermoid can also be dumbbell dermoid where part of it is extraorbital you can see that this part of the lesion is extraorbital this is intraorbital and that is a zone of communication when you want to excise it you have to do osteotomy on both the sides of the lesion and excise the lesion en bloc otherwise there is a tendency that part of it will be left behind causing recurrence now how do you suspect that the patient may have sutural extension or extraorbital extension look at the mobility of the lesion if the lesion has restricted mobility either vertically or horizontally the possibility of sutural extension is real in that situation you have to do a 3d reconstruction of a ct scan and you can actually see a small defect in the bone and you can notice a small defect here as well that indicates that this small dermoid is actually extending extra orbitally the consequence being that if you try to excise it it will rupture one second the part of it that is left behind within the bone and outside can recur and it may even form a fistula so it is imperative that you identify if a particular dermoid has sutural extension orbital bone extension and extra orbital extension no dermoids can be sometime located in the deep orbit this is a deep orbital dermoid which is the most difficult surgical challenge because it does not have a clearly defined wall it is a very thin wall and these generally rupture during surgery requiring marsupialization this is a elderly lady she has even developed a cataract but at the same time she has what looks like a lacrimal gland tumor that was in fact because of a dermoid that she always had which ruptured because of minor injury and she developed inflammation so it's an inflamed dermoid so in adults if you uh, consider well circumscribed masses the differential diagnosis are cavernous hemangioma neurilemoma neurofibroma and fibrous histocytoma so the, these are the top four differential diagnoses for a well circumscribed orbital mass in adults cavernous hemangioma presents like a ovoid lesion spherical to ovoid lesion typically intraconal sometimes with an extraconal extension all these are cavernous hemangioma of various sizes you can note that they are typically intraconal and they produce mild to moderate amount of proptosis because they grow very slowly at the expense of the orbital fat so the amount of proptosis is disproportionately less to the size of the lesion which is fairly large neurilemoma as compared to cavernous hemangioma is more ovoid like this it has this kind of a linear extended configuration it can occur from supraorbital nerve or infraorbital nerve or from any other nerve when we excise neurilemoma we have to take out the nerve from which it is arising you can see that this particular patient has a lesion arising from the infraorbital nerve 
and that is the segment of the nerve that has been excised, otherwise it tends to recur. Neurofibroma, on the other hand, can have various morphologies. It can be spheroid, it can be bosselated or lobulated. As you see here, there is a larger lesion here and a small bosselation. So it has multi-variate uh, kind of uh, architecture, no defined shape. Fibrous histiocytoma or benign fibrous histiocytoma simulates neurilemma. It is extraconal typically and has an ovoid configuration. Clinically, it is impossible to say whether a patient has benign fibrous histiocytoma or a neurilemma unless the patient, of course, has hyperesthesia in the area of distribution of the nerve that is involved. Then it confirms that it is neurilemma. Now, four major causes for axial proptosis in adults are cavernous hemangioma, lymphangioma, optic nerve glioma, and optic nerve sheet meningioma. We already saw cavernous hemangioma. This is a patient with lymphangioma. Lymphangioma can be intraconal and extraconal. And if it is intraconal lymphangioma, it can cause axial proptosis. Whereas this patient has come for a cataract surgery and has, has relative afferent pupillary defect. And the close-up of the optic nerve shows optociliary shunt vessels, which is very characteristic of optic nerve sheath meningioma. It gives the tram track appearance on imaging because of the calcification and it is concentric or epicentric to the uh, pericentric to the optic nerve. It is a lesion of the optic nerve sheet and this patient has relative afferent pupillary defect because of a optic nerve sheath meningioma. Now, abaxial proptosis. Abaxial proptosis is non-axial proptosis with displacement. Four common conditions for abaxial proptosis in adults are lymphoproliferative lesions, neurilemma, lacrimal gland tumor, and other structural tumor. Lymphoproliferative lesions, of course, are the most common causes for abaxial proptosis in adults. These mold around the eyeball. As you see here, they have an isodense character on CT scan, isointense on MRI mold around the eye and cause rubbery lesion and that is the inferior displacement that this patient has. Sometimes when you look at the phonesis, you find a salmon pink lesion. Of course, there is this posterior orbital extension as well and this fleshy lesion with salmon pink color actually clinically tips you off that you're looking at a orbital lymphoma. Now, neurilemma, depending on the location of the lesion, can cause displacement and proptosis. This patient has displacement superiorly and nasally caused by infraorbital nerve neurilemma. One more patient with infraorbital nerve neurilemma causing superior uh, displacement. You can see the nerve that has been excised along with the lesion. This patient has a supraorbital nerve neurilemma. You can see its elongated configuration extending all along and that is the nerve that has been excised along with the neurilemma. It can be bilobed as well. As you see here, this has two lobes. In between that, there is a thickened nerve. That is the reason why you should excise it completely because sometimes what happens is in the nerve stump that you leave, there could be small neurilemma matter, which may start growing later, causing recurrence or what is called recurrence because you would have excised just the main lesion itself and have, must have might have left the nerve behind. In lacrimal gland tumors, Epithelial lesions, 50% are benign and 50% are malignant. And among malignant lesions, 50% are adenocystic carcinoma. Pleomorphic adenoma is characteristic because it occurs in young adults and grows very, very slowly, causes some amount of downward displacement of the eye and medial displacement as well, and mild to moderate proptosis. Why mild to moderate proptosis despite the size of the lesion is because there is fossa formation in the bone. So it accommodates itself by creating space within the bone. And that is the reason these patients may not have such severe proptosis as compared to the size of the lesion. And the treatment of choice is complete excision without breaching the capsule of the lesion. Sometimes there could be erosion of the bone, as you see here, mimicking a malignant lesion, but despite which dura is never involved. So you will not have any complication during surgery because the dura in that area would be intact. This is one more pleomorphic adenoma. These are really nice, well-circumscribed lesions which don't cause any functional deficit and, and typically they don't affect the Schirmer's value. So they don't affect the tear function because they don't destroy the entire lacrimal gland. They grow only from a part of it. If a patient were to have a similar lesion in the supratemporal area, 
but crossing the midline and having hypesthesia or parasthetic signs in the distribution of the supraorbital nerve, then you suspect adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. It also destroys bone, but the bone uh, destruction here is irregular. It is not fossa formation. As you see here, there is bone destruction, which is very unlike pleomorphic adenoma, where there is a smooth contouring, whereas here in adenoid cystic carcinoma, you find irregular bone contour. The variable and positional proptosis are seen in many vascular conditions, one of which is orbital varices. When you do Valsalva maneuver or ask the patient to bend down, proptosis increases. That indicates that the patient has orbital varices. Also, patients who have arteriovenous malformation, you have to look for pulsation, thrill, and ruie when you're evaluating them, and positional proptosis has to be elicited. Another non-vascular condition which can cause pulsatile proptosis or positional proptosis is neurofibroma with meningoencephalocele. Because bone being missing, this is called a bare orbit sign, there is direct pulsation transmission from the brain to the eye, and that is the reason why these patients have pulsatile proptosis. So one of the uh, configurations of orbital tumors is triradiate lesion. The meaning of triradiate lesion is that it is centered in the spinoid wing with extension into the orbit, temporal fossa, and intracranially. And the five characteristic triradiate lesions are the spinoid wing meningioma, eosinophilic granuloma, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, and metastasis. If you have an elderly lady or a man for that matter, coming to you with proptosis, with downward displacement of the eye and temporal fossa fullness as you see here, then you clinically suspect spinoid wing meningioma. She also has corneal exposure because of the proptosis that is secondary. This individual also has temporal fossa fullness with downward displacement of the eye and a tumor which is located in the spinoid wing with extension intracranially into the temporal fossa and into the orbit, a typical case of spinoid wing meningioma. Now, here is a patient, young patient with eosinophilic granuloma. Again, you note that the lesion is in the spinoid wing with a triradiate configuration. And of course, osteosarcoma typically follows the triradiate configuration because it is most common in the spinoid wing. This is a patient who is a survivor of retinoblastoma or undergone radiation earlier, developed osteosarcoma as a second malignant neoplasm. That is how common, commonly it develops. Uh, Ewing sarcoma is also a triradiate lesion. This is a rarer entity. But what you notice in all triradiate lesion is temporal fossa fullness. So if you have a patient with proptosis with temporal fossa fullness, then you have to consider triradiate lesions as differential diagnosis. In elderly individuals, of course, you can metastasis either prostate, breast, or even lung. This is an elderly individual again with a triradiate lesion. You can see centered on the spinoid wing, large orbital component, small intracranial and a medium-sized temporal fossa component with destruction of the bone. This patient also had punched out lesion in the skull, confirming that he had multiple myeloma. There was a plasma cytoma in the orbit. Now, having uh, come to a clinical radiological uh, suspicion or diagnosis as to what the lesion could be, then you go on to the next step. The next logical step is to decide whether you want to do surgery or not. There are certain clinical situations where you say a clear no to surgery. You will not do surgery. There are certain clinical situations where you clearly say, yes, you would definitely want to do surgery. There are some gray areas where you may or may not want to do surgery. I will elaborate all this. Now, if you have a patient with bilateral proptosis, a young child with bilateral proptosis with temporal fossa fullness, with no periocular ecchymosis, it is classic of metastatic Wilms disease where you will not want to do surgery and send the patient to a pediatric oncologist straight away. Exactly similar situation, bilateral proptosis, temporal fossa fullness with subconjunctival and periocular ecchymosis, classically called the raccoon eye sign and a triradiate lesion. This is metastatic neuroblastoma. Again, here you will not do surgery, you will send the patient away to a pediatric oncologist. We saw this child earlier, proptosis with subconjunctival hemorrhage and growth spot in the fundus, nothing but granulocytic sarcoma. All you need to do here is not surgery, but a peripheral blood smear. If you're suspecting plasma cytoma, you might as well do a fine needle aspiration cytology to confirm the diagnosis. No surgery was indicated in those patients. There are other patients for non-surgical approaches as well. Like this patient who's a young adult, 
who has very mild proptosis. I can't even say that he has proptosis in this picture. He has extremely minimal proptosis, one millimeter proptosis, caused by a lesion which is located right in the orbital apex. And he happens to be an airline pilot. And obviously, he has been failed on a medical examination that he underwent recently. Otherwise, he was asymptomatic. He had no symptoms whatsoever. Now, this is what his visual field show. He has visual field deficit caused by optic nerve compression by a lesion which is located at the orbital apex, impinging on the superior orbital fissure and the optic nerve. Now, looking at the diffusion weighted images, it is definitely a cavernous hemangioma. There is no doubt about the clinical diagnosis. So, suppose you were to excise it. Cavernous hemangioma is a surgeon's delight, and you might want to excise this patient, excise this tumor. You will you'll be meddling in the area of the superior orbital fissure and the optic nerve causing visual field defect, or you might actually cause diplopia in this patient, thus precluding him of his occupation, which is, his, which is flying. So here you want to use an alternative treatment, not surgical, that is stereotactic radiation. 4,000 centigrade of radiation was delivered to the tumor, and you can see that the tumor has shrunk to about 20-30% of its initial volume, and its visual field defect is completely reversed. So these are situations when you want to do a non-surgical measure. This is from the literature where gamma knife radiation was used. Again, the small tumor pressing on the optic nerve reduced in size, thus reversing the visual field defect. So the current dictum is that if you have a pear-shaped lesion impinging on the superior orbital fissure and the optic nerve, better not to do surgery. And if you're sure about the clinical diagnosis supported by radiology, then you might as well consider alternative therapeutic measures. If you have any doubt at all about the clinical diagnosis, then you might want to do surgery. Now, you're going on to injections, which are minimal interventional non-surgical measures. Injection, pisibanil or bleomycin have become the standard of care for orbital lymphangioma. This lady wants pros uh, only cosmetic change because she has mild proptosis in the right eye and she has occasional subconjunctival hemorrhage caused by a lymphangioma. But if you were to debulk it surgically, look at the possible complications. The lesion is around the optic nerve, encasing the lateral rectus, SRLPS complex and the medial rectus and also the superior oblique. So this patient can have diplopia if you were to do aggressive debulking. Short of it, you inject pisibanil and you can see that the intraconal component has resolved and the patient has got the cosmosis that she always wanted. A simple injection of pisibanil. One injection. Now, if you have a chocolate cyst or hemorrhage within the lesion, then you aspirate the contents either by ultrasound guidance or if it is palpable without any guidance, you can do that and inject bleomycin or pisibanil. Earlier, we used to inject equal amount. Now, we have reduced it to 50%. For example, if the aspirate is 4 cc, then you inject about 2 cc of bleomycin or pisibanil within the lesion. And over a period of time, it completely scarifies. This is a patient where somebody had attempted a biopsy and had abandoned because of bleeding, thinking that it was rhabdomyosarcoma. It was patient was referred. It was actually a lymphangioma and microcystic lymphangioma. And on injection of bleomycin, it resolved giving back the cosmosis. This was a patient with acute proptosis because of a chocolate cyst where we drained blood and injected bleomycin. And as you see, the patient has resolved. There's a patient with anterior orbital lymphangioma where the anterior component was debulked and the one around the inferior oblique muscle and the inferior rectus muscle posteriorly was injected with bleomycin and the patient has stable regression. So bleomycin has come to play a major role in the management of lymphangioma. One more situation where there's anterior orbital lymphangioma managed again with bleomycin. Now, the role of injection is not just with lymphangioma. It can also be used for eosinophilic granuloma. Eosinophilic granuloma is classically treated with curatage, but the consequence of curatage in an area where there is a large bone defect in the orbital roof with dural involvement can be disastrous. And neurosurgical approaches for this curable lesion is overkill. So here, what we do is a safe biopsy from the center of the lesion and wait for the pathologist to confirm that it is eosinophilic granuloma. This is done under frozen section or rapid diagnostic uh, measures such as squash or imprint cytology. It takes about 15 minutes for the pathologist to give you the diagnosis. The child is held under anesthesia for that duration. And intralesional triamcillone, a 40 rupee drug 
is all that is required to be injected. And you can see how nicely the bone remodels over six months. So there is no major surgery required here. All that is required is a small incisional biopsy, intraoperative confirmation of diagnosis, because what, how do we know it is not rhabdomyosarcoma? So you have to have intraoperative confirmation followed by intralesional injection and the lesion results. One more situation where there is a bone defect with my small dural extension. This patient has started resolving in about three months following intralesional injection. One more lesion that is amenable to injection is orbital dermoid. Now, not all orbital dermoids are treated by injection, but only in those where surgery may be difficult or if the patient does not want any external incision. Like this patient has a large lesion. Even if you were to make an incision along the lid crease, the lesion has to be excised by a larger incision, which may be visible. Patient does not want that. Here you want injection. So I'll show you a small video clip which shows the procedure. A recent alternative for dumbbell dermoids can be minimally invasive foam sclerotherapy with an anionic surfactant, sodium tetradecal sulfate, with a concentration of 30 mg per ml. Under local anesthesia, the perimeter and epicenter of the lesion are marked and a whiteboard 18 gauge needle is used to aspirate out the contents of the cyst, ensuring complete collapse. Here, 4 cc of contents were aspirated and 1 cc of sodium tetradecal sulfate was taken for foaming it to 2 cc by modified tessari tubion technique. While the foam is being generated, the needle should be kept in place within the lesion. The sclerosant of desired quantity is then injected. A recent you can see the consequent results. Over a period of time, the lesion starts resolving and remains stable result. Now the next is incisional biopsy. We talked about injections and non-surgical management. The next in modalities that is uh, possible in the orbit is incisional biopsy. Incisional biopsy is indicated for suspected malignant tumors which are poorly localized and infiltrative on imaging and are associated with crucial structures. You don't know what it is. But if you want to completely excise this lesion, it may have functional implications because it is associated with optic nerve or extraocular muscles or lacrimal gland, etc. Or for intraoperative diagnosis. The most important aspect about incisional biopsy is that you should not have a wrong or a non-specific diagnosis. By literature, 8 to 20 percent of orbital biopsies result in non-specific or misleading diagnosis because of non-uniform pathology within the lesion. Examples are lymphoproliferative lesions where part of it may be benign reactive lymphadiaplasia, part of it may be atypical lymphadiaplasia, and only a part of it may be lymphoma. So non-specific uh, diagnosis or misleading wrong diagnosis are possible in orbital biopsies. Now, this is an example of a patient with rhabdomyosarcoma. We do both superficial, mid-zonal, and deep biopsy. So we have access to all the three tissues. Now let's see what was found in the superficial biopsy. We found only inflammation and fibrosis. For example, if we were to do only biopsy from a superficial zone, we would have found only inflammation and fibrosis. Thus, this patient would have been treated with steroids because we thought it was inflammation. In the mid-zone and deep biopsy, we found rhabdomyosarcoma, which is embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Obviously, that was the diagnosis. So in pediatric or adult round cell tumors, peripheral zone is inflammation with fibrosis, which is nothing but tissue reaction. Deeper component may actually be necrotic and the mid zone may actually have a tumor. So unless you do biopsy from superficial, mid zonal and deep well past the epicenter, you will not get a representative sample. So that is the concept. Even in patients with lymph and lymphoma, intermediate zone is the one that contains the tumor. If you have a patient of this sort where there is a lesion in both the orbits with destruction of bone, here superficial biopsy showed inflammation and fibrosis. Deep biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation with multinuclear giant cells. And when we stained with special stains, GMS stain showed fungal granuloma. So special stains are important if you are su suspecting fungal granuloma or tubercular granuloma. So in orbital biopsy, the concept is that we have to do a layered biopsy, superficial, intermediate, and deep, well beyond the epicenter. 
and estimation of depth is based on CT scan and MRI and special stains are mandatory. Suppose you have difficulty in going to the center of the lesion in a posteriorly located lesion, yet you want a representative biopsy, then you can use intraoperative navigation guided biopsy. There are many navigational guided uh, tools that are currently available. You can use any, any one of this. The idea is to get an intraoperative estimation of exactly where you are before performing a biopsy. That is the patient registration. And you can see that even during biopsy, you can exactly know where your instrument is. Instrument can become navigable. Exactly where your instrument that is touching the lesion is so that you can get a representative sample. What are the indications for excisional biopsy? Any benign or malignant tumor which is well localized and circumscribed, which is non-infiltrative and is not associated with any of the crucial structures in the orbit, with minimal risk of functional deficit is to be excised, irrespective of whether you think it is benign or malignant. If it is well so localized and circumscribed and has no imminent complication, it is better that it is excised. What are the surgical approaches? Let's forget about neurosurgical and endonasal approach. Just in the orbit, we have transcutaneous, transconjunctival, and a combined approach, depending on whether the lesion is located in the anterior orbit, mid-orbit, and deep orbit. In anterior orbitotomy, there are various approaches. Eyelid crease incision or upper eyelid crease incision is a very popular approach. It, is, it goes by the name of Harris. B is for Benedict. Subro incision is called Benedict incision. This is the lid crease incision, which goes by the name of Harris. And there is subciliary incision in the lower eyelid, which is used for approach to the inferior orbit. And there is lower lid crease incision, which goes by the name of Davis, which is at about four millimeter from the lid margin. We have a medial, supramedial incision that is called the Lynch incision. And you can also have a Byron Smith vertical lid split incision. These are the anterior orbitotomy incisions. Eyelid crease incision can be used for dermoids as you see here, but for dermoids, which are small, you can also use a direct incision. In this video, you can see that there's a small dermoid here. You don't have to make a large lid crease incision, but make a small incision right on top of the tumor. For general ophthalmologists or those who do minimal oculoplasty, this becomes important because dermoid is one of the very common lesions, even for pediatric ophthalmologists. They can simply excise a dermoid by following certain principles where the lesion should not be held with a forceps directly. You should leave some tissue on top to hold it or use a cryoprobe, otherwise it has a tendency to rupture. Idea is to excise it without rupturing. And if at all you suspect sutural extension or extraorbital extension, then possibly you should refer it to an oculoplasty specialist. So we're not holding the lesion directly, but we have left some tissue on top to excise it. And the pedicle of the lesion, which contains the vasculature, has to be cauterized and excised. This is one more example of a slightly larger dermoid with a broader base. You can mark the incision, which is cosmetically forgiving. This is right under the bro, a curvilinear incision rather than a straight incision. Superficial skin incision followed by orbicularis dissection using a monopolar radiofrequency electrode. Ramita, 15 minutes is okay? Yeah, perfectly all right. No problem. You can carry on. All right. So then you dissect the plane using a tenotomy scissor, which is blunt tip, so that you get into the nice plane. This is again useful for those who do minimal oculoplasty surgery in the sense that they're not into complex oculoplasty surgery, but do want to do simple procedures. This is mainly uncomplicated dermoid excision. Additions are excised using scissors or monopolar electrode, and you progress further along the plane of the dermoid And you hold the lesion using tissue that you're left on top, not directly the wall because the wall may rupture, or you can use a cryoprobe. Wherever there is adhesion, you have to use either a scissor or a RF or a radio electrode. And as you reach the pedicle, you have to use a cautery to excise it so that there is no second, secondary bleeding. Now, this is a patient where there is a supranasal lymphangioma, which was fairly well localized. This is an old video, so pardon me for the quality of the video. I'll forward it rapidly. 
So in lid split incision, you go to the supranasal part of the eyelid junction of the medial one third and lateral two thirds and vertically split the lid. This used to be a procedure that was fairly commonly done earlier. Now we don't do it anymore. So this is a probably a 20 year old video with a lot of movement and bad resolution. You can see lid split right up to the fornix and you can see the lesion that is being dissected now. And once the lesion is uh, nearly 70-80% dissected, you can use a cryoprobe assisted for the dissection and excision of the lesion. So split split is a surgery that used to be performed. And after the lesion is excised, all you need to do is close the lid like you would close a patient with lid laceration. So you simply close it vertically with marginal sutures and rest of the lid is closed with interrupted sutures. Subrow incision can be used for uh, lesions that are located in the superior orbit. Now coming to lateral orbitotomy, this was described as early as 1888. This was the first description of lateral orbitotomy. It was done by Cronlin. Now Cronlin was not a ophthalmologist. He described an incision which was in the opposite direction as the orbit. So this is the configuration of the orbit. He described a U-shaped incision which was pointing towards the temporal side so that he could raise a flap and then get cut the bone and get to the tumor. A modified Cronlin approach was described by Berkey where he went around the lateral canthus and took a straight incision. So we have Cronlin incision which is no longer used. Berkey's extended canthotomy is also very rarely used. What is used is stellarite incision, but even in stellarite incision, instead of using it like a S-shaped, we use a very lazy S, very gentle curve like that. And what is very popular is an eyelid crease incision. Now, if you want to create an eyelid crease incision, this is how you do it. You mark the skin incision along the eyelid crease. Of course, the muscles have to be tagged. I can skip that part. That is the eyelid crease incision. Then you incise the orbicularis and go into the suborbicularis plane. So your plane of dissection is between the orbicularis muscle and the orbital septum. By retraction, you will go directly to the superior orbital margin and then you make the periosteal incision four millimeter from the superior orbital margin and rest of the dissection is the same. So basically you approach the superior orbital margin and the lateral orbital margin using a lid crease incision. Now let's go to uh, the next. Here, in this video, you see a bone cut lateral orbitotomy. So bone cut lateral orbitotomy is not very commonly performed unless the lesion is posterior and you really need a lot of space to access the lesion. Initial steps are the same. Here we are using a superior orbital incision, which is a typical modified stellarite incision, a lazy S incision, a large incision. Orbicularis dissection using electrosurgical devices. Idea is to reach the orbital margin about four millimeter from the orbital margin. Periosteal incision using a monopolar electrode. And the periosteal incision is extended laterally as well until you encounter the junction of the lateral wall and the floor. Periosteal dissection to reach the periorbita. And you have to be very careful in gently separating the periorbita. Bone cut is marked now. Temporalis has already been dissected. The superior edge of the bone cut is at the frontozygomatic suture. Inferiorly, you can go right up to the zygoma. You can use a saw, vertical, a sagittal saw to cut the bone. To its full depth and then you valgus fracture the bone and keep it in a ball of saline so that you can replace it later, later either with wire suture or even glue. This is obviously more invasive and currently we don't use bone cut and instead we use uh, without bone cut. Surgery is performed without bone cut. This is the standard of care at this point in time for any orbital tumor Unless there is an imminent need for a bone cut, you need really large space. And for dissection, you need bone cut. Otherwise, we don't cut the bone. 
you can see this is an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland which has been chemo reduced you can see a bone defect there following that we are doing excision of the tumor with n block excision that means periosteum which is adherent to the tumor is also being excised along with the tumor so your incision is on all the three sides of the tumor superiorly leaving a gap of periosteum behind laterally you can see that normal periosteum about 10 mm is excised along with the lesion tumor is dissected using sharp and blunt dissectors and upon near total uh, dissection you excise it by using cryo probe so that you get to the posterior aspect of the lesion which is carefully excised and if there's a vascular pedicle that has to be cauterized before you excise it that was an adenoid cystic carcinoma that underwent n block excision in this lady and that is the post operative appearance this was a large lesion in a young individual this was just a teenager you can see how large this lacrimal gland tumor is it was fortunately well circumscribed so we excised it but when lacrimal gland tumors again you don't have to you should not cut the bone because otherwise there might be temporal fossa extension so i can show here that a large lesion can still be excised without a bone cut so we are tagging the superior rectus and the lateral rectus in lacrimal gland tumor multiplanar incisions are contraindicated because you might seed the tumor in multiple planes making radiotherapy difficult skin incision orbicularis dissection palpating the superior orbital margin exposing the superior orbital margin and the lateral orbital margin then we make a periosteal incision that is the periosteal incision using bipolar electrode dissection of the periosteum dissection of the periorbita that is suture being separated at this point in time use a larger spatula for posterior periorbital incision make an incision in the orbital septum for the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland which is also involved in this patient we are right on top of the tumor now tumor is dissected by using blunt instruments and cautery etc that was the periosteal band that is being excised using a monopolar electrode bipolar electrode fibrovascular fronts are obviously cauterized this was a multilobulated lesion it is freed up as far as possible before we further mobilize it from the posterior aspect a spatula is being used for further posterior mobilization all under visualization using an operating microscope you can see the size of the lesion without a bone cut let the tumor prolapse and then take time to gently dissect everything else that is adherent to the lesion if it's a fibrous band obviously you can use scissor or cautery if it is something which can be separated by using blunt tipped instruments that is the best and before you cut anything identify the structure you should not cut an extraocular muscle and with cryoprobe assistance slowly and steadily this large lesion comes out without any bone cut just to impress upon you to the fact that bone cut is not really necessary and all that we had made was this incision so this turned out to be an adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland the patient is currently on chemotherapy and radiation going on to minimal excess surgery in orbit the concept is simplicity and clarity lead to good design less less is more is the understanding so in conjunctival approaches we have transcarenkular approach which is uh, which goes by the name of balk and goldberg we have a lateral canthal incision we have an inferior fornicial incision with a lateral canthotomy and inferior cantholysis so you can actually have a transcarenkular incision inferior fornicial incision lateral canthotomy and inferior cantholysis which gives you access to the medial, inframedial, inferior, infralateral, and even part of supralateral orbit. So about two thirds of the orbit can be accessed by transcarenkular incision. Let me show you an example. This is a patient I had earlier showed a dumb a teratoma of the orbit. Here the tumor was on both the sides of the optic nerve. That is the cystic component that is being excised and that is the optic nerve, the pearly white structure. And medial to it was the solid component. That was the groove for the optic nerve. All that could be excised was by the transconjunctival incision. And that is the post-operative results. Of course, the child has residual isotropia that needs to be corrected. 
Now, this is a cavernous hemangioma of the orbit in the intracranial space. This was a professional and wanted to go back to work very soon. Lateral orbitotomy has some morbidity. So here we accessed it using an inferior phonational approach with a lateral canthotomy and inferior cantholysis. Inferior rectus muscle has already been tagged. And we are making an incision about four millimeter from the lower edge of the tarsus, just short of the inferior phonics, all along right up to the carankle. Structures are retracted, palpate the inferior orbital margin using a spatula and then make an incision in the soft tissue just about a millimeter or two millimeter from the inferior orbital margin. Incision of the periosteum very close to the orbital margin not to damage the intraorbital nerve. Then further dissection of the periorbita, endpoint being visualization of infraorbital nerve or the apex of the inferior orbital fissure beyond which you don't go dissect the periorbita. Then once you reach the end point, you cauterize all the perforating blood vessels which are bleeding. Hemostasis is very important in all the steps of the surgery. Then you make a periorbital incision in the quadrant where this intracranial tumor is located. Uh, retract fat on either side using retractors. Dissect the tumor to about 60 to 70% of its visible extent. Then you apply a cryoprobe and further dissection is carried out under visualization and very gently you can wriggle the tumor out. This was a multi-lobed uh, cavernous hemangioma of the orbit. This, of course, is surgeon's delight, but any tumor in the inferior orbit can be excised by using a transcanning table approach. Now, all we need to close here is the lateral canthotomy incision and a few sutures through the inferior phonix. And this is how the patient can look a few weeks from the time of surgery without any morbidity that is associated. These are all patients who have been excised using transcanning table approach. Now, last bit is about what is next after surgery. You cannot leave a patient after surgery just because you have completely removed the tumor. You have to take histopathology into consideration. Like patients who have solitary fibrous tumors may have cellular atypia. And despite the fact that I have completely removed the tumor, I may have still left some microscopic residue. Note that in this CT scan, you can see that there is a small bone excavation there. So that may be the area where there could be microscopic residual, although clinically we have removed everything. So all patients where there is an indication should undergo adjuvant therapy. This is again a patient with solitary fibrous tumor where there was cellular atypia where radiation was indicated. The second concept is that micrometastasis can be taken care of only by systemic therapy. So if you have a tumor, which is a malignant tumor, which is likely to metastasize, despite the fact that currently the patient may not have metastasis on a PET CT scan, if it has a metastatic potential and it has a high mitotic activity, then adjuvant chemotherapy may be indicated. Biologicals in the form of target therapy. So basically you stratify the risk of metastasis and then explain the possibilities to the patient and go ahead as is appropriate. Target therapy has come in in a big way in the orbit. For patients who have, say, lymphoma of the orbit with posterior extension, transconjunctival excision is possible up to the, say, anterior one-third of the orbit. But beyond that, the small component of the tumor that is left is not easily excisable without causing damage to SRLPS complex because the lesion is in that area. So what do we do? We excise the anterior part of the lesion. The posterior component can get radiation or the target therapy that is perilesional rituximab. Six injections, three weekly spaced out can take care of the posterior residual as long as it is mild lymphoma. Now for melanoma, we have the mutations and the target therapy all worked out. This is a very systematic way of treating orbital melanoma or conjunctival melanoma with orbital extension. This is all from the literature where pembrolizumab has been used for an orbital extension of conjunctival melanoma. And you can see nice regression, that is the regress scar for cavernous, for sorry, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the orbit with patient being inoperable because of the age and systemic status, etc. Several groups have used erlotinib, which is epidermal growth factor inhibitor. You can see the tumor doesn't go away completely, but it becomes small and the patient is now able to see it is stable. So patients are more comfortable. For orbital invasion of basal cell carcinoma, we can use vismodegib or sonidegib, which can stabilize the lesion and regress it remarkably. For uh, orbital lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, we can use gentle chemotherapy with bendamustine and rituximab with minimal systemic side effects.
The last bit is about orbital excentration. Now, orbital excentration is a surgery that was considered necessary for orbital retinoblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, adenocystic carcinoma, orbital extension of several eyelid and conjunctival tumors. This was a pejetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma where orbital excentration has been performed. It is also indicated for squamous cell carcinoma with orbital extension. It, is ex it was indicated for even rhabdomyosarcoma and retinoblastoma with orbital extension. But the issue is whether these patients survive following such a you know, major surgery because have we taken care of systemic metastasis at all? So multimodal therapy addresses both the local disease as well as systemic uh, issues such as metastasis. Here, we give a combination of chemotherapy, surgery, and radiotherapy in a logical sequence. That is because systemic chemotherapy alone can take care of micrometastasis, whereas radiation and surgery are good for local disease. This is all learned from various other diseases, other malignancies in the body, such as breast carcinoma, small cell carcinoma of the lung, advanced renal cell carcinoma. All these have improved in survival and prognosis because of multimodal treatment. Otherwise, if you were to do only orbital excentration, you would have a major risk of mortality by systemic metastasis. As you see here, five common indications for orbital excentration have high rate of mortality. In retinoblastoma, for example, for the orbital component, we begin with a new adjuvant chemotherapy. And when the eye becomes thysical, we do an extended enucleation with a long optic nerve stem, deliver stereotactic radiation, and further provide adjuvant therapy. It works well for optic nerve extension as well. As you see here, optic nerve caliber has become normal. Now, enucleation is possible. For patients who had intracranial extension earlier were not treatable, now we can treat them with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Tumor that is left is in the superior orbital fissure, eminently amenable to radiation. Of course, this child needs to be enucleated. And the bonus is, of course, cosmosis. You don't have to do orbital excentration anymore. You can achieve excellent cosmosis with uh, following chemo reduction. You can perform extended enucleation, and patients can look good following a uh, fitting of a custom ocular prosthesis. In rhabdomyosarcoma, you can do a complete excision or excentration to downstage the disease, but the consequences are not satisfactory. Example is this patient where the tumor is all around the inferior rectus muscle. If you were to completely excise that you would be sacrificing inferior rectus, thus causing refractory strabismus. So in such patients, we leave a wedge of the tumor. For example, if this is the inferior rectus and the lesion is all around it, we leave a part of the tumor that is around the inferior rectus and rest of it is excised. And the residual component is, of course, treated with chemotherapy and stereotactic radiation with no strabismus or functional problem at all. For patients where orbital excentration is indeed required, you can make the surgery safer by reducing it and also achieve skin flap closure for an excentration prosthesis. This is the patient of adenoid cystic carcinoma several years ago where this patient, I believe, was treated with excision and radiation. Five years later, she has no residual tumor but developed lung metastasis. That's because chemotherapy was not given. That understanding was not there at that time. Now we actually begin with chemotherapy, reduce the size of the tumor. You can see about 30% reduction in the tumor volume. Then we do an end block excision and further treat with extended stereotactic radiation and adjuvant chemotherapy. Again, you see that there is reduction in the size of the tumor after chemotherapy, after which it is excised. And you don't have to excise the involved orbital bone now bone actually remodels following treatment. So you can conserve cosmosis as well as function. You can see extensive bone destruction completely remodeled in this child with very rare form of adenoid cystic carcinoma without any uh, need for orbital excentration. For patients with intracranial extension, of course, you can try to salvage them. These are very difficult situations. Finally, this patient may need orbital excentration, but at least we can give a chance for these patients by doing what is called afterloaded stereotactic radiation. Here we implant silicon tubes on the bed of the tumor and deliver iridium-192 isotope-based stereotactic interstitial brachytherapy with a reasonably good outcome. So in adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, we have much better success with multimodal treatment as opposed to surgery and radiation alone. 
for sebaceous gland carcinoma with orbital extension, again, chemo reduction is possible. You can see a large sebaceous gland carcinoma where you can see anterior orbital extension following three cycles of chemotherapy. All that is left is this tumor now amenable to excision. So what looks like exenterable may not always need orbital excentration. This is a young patient with a lacrimal sac, sebaceous gland carcinoma, a very rare form where somebody had done a DCR, letting the cat out of the bag, the lesion has intranasal extension, patient had 20-20 vision. So here we started the patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, reduced the tumor, did dacrocystectomy, stereotactic radiation, and adjuvant chemotherapy, and he could retain his eye and vision. So with multimodal treatment, we have much better survival for all, all the tumors that I just described. So in conclusion, I would say that orbital surgery is exciting, but can be a humbling experience because pathologist has the last word. Despite all your clinical acumen and clinical radiological correlation, what you think may not always turn out to be uh, the final diagnosis. Complications sometimes can be vision threatening and that can be a very uh, unsettling experience because you might have done a perfect surgery, but because the patient would have bled secondarily overnight, the patient may lose vision. So all these complications have to be potentially explained to the patient and the attendant before you take up a patient for orbital surgery. Suboptimal management without uh, regard to oncological principles can Im impact life salvage, especially in tumors which are potential to metastasize. So in conclusion, I would say that logical approach to orbital tumors begins with a good clinical radiological diagnosis, planning, surgical approach, and histopathology. And finally, histopathology guided adjuvant therapy for optimization of outcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Santosh. I think uh, that was really a master blaster class and perhaps just by this whole lecture, which was so nicely done pictographically as well as uh, with the help of the videos. If one just attends this lecture, I think uh, to my mind from whatever I could make out, you need not study orbit from anywhere. And once you go through it, I, I think you will not even forget it because it was so well uh, described, uh, just the pertinent points and everything about uh, the orbit. Uh, so we have Dr. Vikas Menon and Dr. Seema Das uh, for their, I would request them for their comments now. Um, thank you, Dr. Namrata. And thank you, sir, for such a comprehensive overview of the orbital tumors. I felt like uh, going through a textbook in the last one hour and more like an atlas, uh, better than an atlas even because there were videos and there were live surgeries which we could see. Uh, it was really summarized very well uh, for the benefit of audiences. We, I would just like to summarize the whole thing. Uh, we learned about uh, the approach, how to begin approach uh, approaching a patient with an orbital tumor, how, how important is the history taking, how important is the examination, evaluation, basic hurdles is so important. And then classifying the tumors into a uh, pediatric group and the adult group, which gives you a certain differential diagnosis, which you can have in your mind. And then based on their uh, anatomical location, which you can see a lot from whether it's an ab abaxial proptosis or an axial proptosis, so all those points we learned about. Then we also learned about uh, most of the common uh, orbital tumors. I think whatever we see uh, over, whatever we have seen over the years, you pr practically covered almost all of them in the pediatric age group and the importance of uh, examining a patient completely, even a systemic examination. So you covered that all also. For example, you showed a patient of leukemia having rot spots. So if one is uh, vigilant to the presence of these rot spots and other signs like cafe ole spots, certainly in many of these cases, surgeries can be avoided and one can get a clue just by doing a peripheral blood smear or uh, proper imaging and uh, identifying various signs of syndromes as well as uh, which are associated with orbital tumors. Then we moved on to uh, the importance of biopsy, how important it is to do a proper biopsy very well said and very well put, sir, that we do get a lot of patients where mostly the biopsy is uh, done superficially and not the correct plane. And then it creates a problem because the what we see in histopathology is just fibrous tissue and inflammation. And the patient has already undergone a surgery. Patient is reluctant to uh, undergo surgery again. So my uh, stress again is on the same point that that was a very valid paper that you showed that, you know, it's so important to get it right in the first go 
it is very important for all the people who are doing biopsy to to understand the importance of going to the exact proper plane and not just do a very half hearted superficial kind of biopsy because most of the times these patients are not then uh, willing to go for another surgery for the same thing and that may delay their proper diagnosis that may delay their proper treatment and then we saw some magnificent videos some excellent videos and i think you covered all the approaches uh, that we commonly use for the orbit even the old video that you showed lid split i i, I still use that technique uh, i think it's a very good technique for the supranasal quadrant and you can avoid damaging uh, the superior oblique muscle and reach the supranasal quadrant of the orbit very easily and uh, works very well so all the techniques that you showed i think uh, that covers everything and uh, so most of the uh, you showed the us uh, the malignancies and uh, most of the malignancies and the multimodal technique of the treatment that we follow these days sometimes there is an issue when we send these patients for chemotherapy uh, and adjuvant treatment to uh, medical oncologists they have a slightly different opinion they they want that you know there is no margin clearance in orbital tumors like when you send them for adjuvant chemo or adjuvant radiation but i think as more and more data and more and more literature will come up supporting the the role of uh, multimodal therapy in these orbital tumors uh, gradually we'll also uh, get to face less resistance and we'll have to do less explaining uh, about these patients that you know how adjuvant therapy works in these patients so i, I think uh, that was really great and it was a pleasure being here and listening to you once again thank you so much sir thank you ma'am dr seema uh, yeah, thank you very much sir um, for uh, again this you know, extensive revision and for a uh, very concise presentation as usual and uh, thanks a lot vikas for summarizing it perfectly so i don't think i have anything else to add here but if i can ask uh, maybe one or two questions uh, so one is uh, about the neurilemoma and the second is about the orbital varices because these are the two tumors i think even the oculoplastic surgeons um from the management perspective uh, are falls into the relatively uh, difficult category so for schwannomas uh, if the tumors are extending say till the orbital apex or sometimes uh, reaching a little beyond that what is your approach uh, do you go by the orbital approach or combine it with the neurosurgical approach and any role of any um, post operative adjuvant treatment Right. So uh, I generally don't go by neurosurgical approach because that causes unnecessary morbidity to the patient, and complete excision is not required. If the patient has a, say, for example, very rare form of neurilemoma arising from, uh, say, third nerve and extending through the superior orbital fissure, etc., you can limit uh, to debulking, and residual uh, tumor can easily be treated with stereotactic radiation. It will stabilize it. It will not promise that uh, it will not grow back again. it may grow very very slowly patient may not have any functional deficit at all and may not need any second surgery so instead of radical excision by neurosurgical approach i would go for a limited excision debulking uh, which will take care of the proptosis and for the small residual component in the superior orbital fissure area or any crucial structure i would give radiation Okay, thank you, sir. And the second is about the orbital varices. I mean, uh, again, there is no uh, very clear-cut protocol of management for the varices, and for the patients who who comes to us with say a long-standing varices with an inophthalmos uh, with a very variable kind of proptosis. So, and if they are keen on some intervention, so how do you approach those patients? Those are very difficult patients. In fact. Uh, even if you do endovascular intervention using an interventional radiologist neuro radiologist etc the relief is minimal because they will not be just one channel there will be multiple channels and you can't close them all so these patients are um, i don't do any active intervention for them i counsel them to change their lifestyle a little bit instead of bending you know if they want to mainly it's the those who want to bend and work they can sit down and work instead of bending physically you know the ch certain changes in lifestyle can help them minimize the symptoms not that it will completely take away okay thank thank you thank you sir so i think uh, there are some questions on our uh, youtube facebook and our and on our platform uh, dr aladin from chennai wants to know in a few large cases of orbital lymphangioma even after doing aspiration and then injection of half biomycin 
retrobulbar hemorrhage occurs. So how do you prevent it? Well, in that case, you can pre-treat these patients if you, well, retrobulbar hemorrhage is a possibility. So when you pre-treat these patients with steroids and post-treat them with steroids following excision or use uh, tranexamic acid just after you have aspirated, then the chance of hemorrhage can be minimized. Okay, and then uh, we have Dr. Sarvana Bhava. I think uh, maybe Vikas can take this question. Uh, he's congratulated you for a very awesome masterclass, uh, Santosh, which was indeed uh, true. And he wants to know if you can enumerate advanced bilateral, uh, can you enumerate advanced bilateral retinoblastoma with systemic meds? So I think probably he wants to know the treatment of advanced bilateral retinoblastoma with systemic meds. Well, that is really a bad prognostic situation with systemic meds, uh, bone marrow uh, transplantation is one option, but uh, again, very few centers in our country are able to do that successfully along with uh, systemic chemotherapy. As of now, the prognosis does remain uh, grim. Bone marrow transplantation is one option. Sir, would you like to add? I totally agree with you. It's a very, um, you know, bad situation because currently there is no cure and uh, despite bone marrow transplantation, the chance of cure is less than 5%. So I think it's a situation where palliative treatment is uh, warranted. Okay. Dr. Seema, if you can take this question, uh, Dr. Jay Krishnan, Ganesh Kumar, Dr. Jay Krishnan wants to know how do you choose between bleomycin and ethanolamine for sclerotherapy? Uh, well, I think uh, personally, I use bleomycin and uh, because that's a little more gentler. The inflammation we see post-injection is less. So in terms of, say, post-operative uh, swelling, proptosis and other complications, that probably has a little more safer profile. Um, ethanolamine, I think, is more uh, useful in situations like uh, Dr. Santosh had showed where you need a foam sclerotherapy, where you, you need to spread the drug over a little more surface area. So in those kind of situations, uh, I think ethanol amine oleate uh, is a preferred drug. Uh, but in some patients, what we use is a combination of both the things. Uh, we use bleomycin along with a uh, foam sclerotherapy along with ethanol amine oleate. So those are the situations I think it gives a much better result, especially in the combined venolymphatic kind of malformations. Uh, sir, anything you want to add? Uh, for venolymphatic malformation, bleomycin is the treatment of choice. Pisipanil, if it's available, it's very good. I've used it, but because of COVID, you know, we are not, they have difficulty in importing the drug. It's a Japanese drug provided free of cost to anybody in the developing world, but we need a drug license for that. That's all. It's a very useful drug. Now, for serous line cavities, you know, cysts with serous line cavities, ethanolamine oleate is a very good drug, such as uh, patients who have uh, microphthalmus with cyst. Ethanolamine oleate uh, does not cause inflammation in the sense that even if you have a small eye, rudimentary eye with a large cyst, it doesn't cause inflammation, so it does not theoretically induce uh, sympathetic ophthalmia, even if you leave the eye intact. So ethanolamine oleate is a good option for serous line cavities, whereas uh, uh, sodium tetradical sulfate, which can be foamed, can be used, minimal quantity can be used for a larger surface so that the foam actually goes and touches all the walls of the cyst or a lesion. Uh, it is not useful for lymphangioma to the best of my knowledge, foam sclerotherapy. It is mainly for, uh, say, dermoids where you need smaller amount of injection to treat a larger cavity. So Vikas, would you want to add or I think the answer is complete between... Uh... Oh. We have tried it actually as to, as a sensitizer to uh, the lining of uh, lymphangiomas, uh, and then once the because the entire lesion is covered with a small amount of sclerosant, so that gives a sensitizes the lining, and then after that you put bleomycin. So so there are a few reports of that. Um, otherwise, bleomycin is the most commonly used drug, and as I said, STS or a foam sclerotherapy thing is more useful for dermoid kind of a thing. Okay, so uh, now uh, there's another question from uh, Dr. Gyan Bhaskar again, who's congratulated you on, on your excellent talk. And uh, he wants to know what is the ideal treatment of hemangioma uh, of the supranasal aspect in a 15-year-old child? What is hemangioma? Uh, it's a hemangioma. Uh, 
Cavernous hemangioma excision is the treatment of choice. Supranasal uh, can be excised by lid split or even uh, supranasal uh, skin incision. But if it is capillary hemangioma, irrespective of the age, uh, if the lesion is stable, so in capillary hemangioma, there is what is called a phase of proliferation, phase of plateau, and phase of regression. If you catch the lesion in the phase of regression or phase of plateau, then uh, propranolol does not work so well. Then we give intralesional steroids. If it's in the phase of proliferation, which I doubt it will be in a 15-year-old, then uh, propranolol oral is the drug of choice. Okay, now there are three uh, more questions and uh, I think each of them is asking for what would be the new adjuvant therapy. So, uh, Dr. Alex wants to know what is the new adjuvant therapy that you give for extensive sebaceous cell carcinoma for adenocystic car carcinoma of the uh, uh, lacrimal gland and for uh, solitary fibrous uh, tumors in a young child after eight years after eight years of remission? Well, in uh, solitary fiber, fibrous tumor, uh, there is no indication for chemotherapy unless it is the malignant variant. That means that you have to have a lot of cellular ATP and mitotic activity to call it a malignant variant of solitary tumor, which is very rare. And it is a surgical disease and the residual is treated typically by adjuvant radiation. Of course, there are chemotherapy protocol for disseminated malignant SFT. Now for sebaceous gland carcinoma and adenocystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, it is 5-fluorouracil-based chemotherapy where 5-FU is given along with uh, cisplatin. Okay. So I think you've answered all the questions. There's one more uh, question. I think Dr. Vikas can take this. Can Dr. Anil Verma has asked, can biomycin be used for extraconal hemangioma? Extraconal hemangioma. Hemangioma, as Sir just said, if if it's a cavernous hemangioma, then it is better excised because it's not a, a, a cystic kind of a lesion. So sclerotherapies are usually used for a cystic kind of a, a lesion where you have a large blood filled cyst, you aspirate the blood or fluid, whatever is there. And then you use the sclerosin to collapse the, the cyst and induce an inflammation in the within the cavity or the cyst. And that inflammation ultimately leads to scarring and, and uh, obliteration of the cavity. Hemangiomas are usually not uh, like a cavitary lesion or not like a, a cystic lesion. So they are better excised if it's a cavernous. And if it's a capillary hemangioma, sir, just mentioned that, you know, it's better to use a, a drug like propranolol or steroids. So I think there are a lot of congratulatory messages now, Santosh, to just uh, name a few from Dr. Paul T. Finger. What a wonderful teacher that you are. And uh, then uh, again from Dr. J. Matthew, from Anna Maria Duna. Rodriguez, I don't know you would recognize them. So that is why uh, from, from Ecuador. And then also your patients who are possibly watching this on the Facebook who have, uh, you know, uh, greeted you. So thank you so much uh, for doing this. Any last comments that you would want to give or Vikas or Seema would want to uh, say something before we close? I just want to say that not to be intimidated by orbital tumors. They have to be dealt with uh, systematically. And uh, if you have the competence, then you should deal with it to, uh, as long as your competence permits. Otherwise, it's best to refer out. And never to forget that 50% of orbital tumors are malignant and have a systemic connotation. So never to ignore histopathology and the information that it gives. Vikas? Uh... Um. Ma'am, I would just say that I, 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 every time I listen to uh, Sir's lecture and every time there's something new to learn from it. And today also there were a lot of new things, a lot of new targeted therapies he talked about uh, and the surgical approaches that he showed. It it reminds me of the time when uh, I used to be solo and be in the OR with him. And it's really like, you know, going back to the textbook, revising everything. It's always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Vikas, for joining with us today. Dr. Seema? Yeah, I, I totally agree with what, uh, you know, with, uh, Eko and Eko with what Vikas had said. It's a pleasure to listen to Dr. Santosh. And uh, yeah, every time his talk has something, you know, new to learn from and carry back home. Thank you so much once again, sir, for this very comprehensive talk. Thank you, Namrita, for the Thank opportunity you. and for oh, moderating. No, thank you, Santosh. No, it I, I, I could do very limited moderation of whatever orbit I knew, but uh, I think uh, 
uh, you can see there are a lot of more than the questions there are a lot of you know greetings and congratulations on that excellent uh, master class that you gave and of course this is going to be there on our AIOS website uh, anybody who wants to you know watch it again can watch it again so thank you so much we've had one of the highest uh, you know delegates if i may say so people watching on all the three uh, platforms today so uh, again uh, that is a great thing so thank you uh, so much again santosh thank you vikas and seema i would also like to thank our team uh, which is at the back uh, mr kripal rana and his team from the aios headquarter and dr anand sethi uh, mr sharik uh, who are managing the audio visual so thank thanks so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. good night